Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Valentine's Day. On a day that we typically celebrate love, Ben said you better start your sermon with John 3.16, the best example of love ever. In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift of your Son, and we thank you for the ultimate example of love that you showed to us. On this day, as we are unable to gather together, we just ask that you remind us of your love and that you would draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning, God created. What a beautiful start to the best story ever. Now, over the past several weeks, we have covered many pieces of the story, the story of beginnings. In week one, Ben helped us see how faith and science can work together. Even though science theories change, God remains the same. In week two, Ben started his sermon saying, if he was a missionary in Africa for 20 years and one of you came to visit him and you brought him a runza, if that runza dropped in the mud, he would still pick that thing up and he would gobble it up because that runza would be so valuable to him. Ben emphasized that we are created in God's image, and so we are valuable to God. We are God's most prized possession. In the third week of our series, Ben and I talked together about marriage. We, we preached about some practical things that people can do to maintain their marriage so that it can flourish. We talked about how we need to communicate, serve, forgive, and pray. And then at the end of January, we heard about the beauty and brokenness in sexuality. Ben used the example of a river and how a river has boundaries, while also emphasizing the importance of grace and forgiveness. And last week, once again, the snow meant we got to watch a YouTube video of Ben Sermon, much like the snow and cold today is providing. Ben posed a really interesting idea last week of what Adam might have done in the Garden of Eden when he was instructed to tend the earth because it was a perfect place without disease or decay. And so he talked about Adam's purpose and he encouraged all of us to think about our purpose and our calling, which leads perfectly into today's message. Today's sermon could be boiled down to two key parts about God's nature in this story of creation. The first one is that God is creative. And the second thing is that God provides. So I want to read our scripture today from Genesis chapter 1, 20, verse 20 to 25. And if there's any children watching, today's sermon, man, I wrote it for you guys. So I hope you enjoy this. We have lots of fun stuff about animals today. So Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. If we just look at this small part of creation, about the creatures of the sea and the birds in the air and the living creatures on the land. I mean, how can we not say that God is creative? Did you know, I have some animal facts for you. Did you know that a polar bear's hair is not white? It's colorless. Every thick strand of hair is hollow and it reflects the light, making the polar bear seem white, you know, because of the snow all around it. Actually, the skin of a polar bear is black. How creative is that? A giraffe has seven bones in its neck, 
which is the same amount that a human has. And yet my neck does not exactly look like a giraffe's neck because obviously those bones are much larger. This is really cool. If you ever look at a gorilla at their nose, they have all those like wrinkles on a nose. So those are called a nose print. And every single gorilla has a different pattern on their nose, kind of like how we have, you know, like a fingerprint, a thumbprint. That's how people who work with gorillas can tell them apart by their nose print. That's so creative. All right, how about hummingbirds? Who loves hummingbirds? In order for a hummingbird to hover in the air, they can beat their wings up to 200 times per second. Not per minute, like I thought, per second. That's crazy. And they are so agile. They have such good control over their bodies that they can like fly backwards while beating their wings that fast. That's crazy to me. Oh, this is kind of cool. A pregnant nine-banded armadillo always gives birth to four identical babies. That's pretty, pretty, pretty creative. Now, many of you would know this since we live, you know, in rural Nebraska, but horses and cows sleep while standing up. Now, can you imagine God being like, hmm, how about for something different? We make these future farm animals sleep standing up. That'd be kind of fun, right? Like God is so creative. The horn of a rhinoceros is made from compacted hair, not a bone, which is what I thought. I thought it was like a really strong bone or something. It is compacted hair. And cats, we have a cat named Nala. Cats use their whiskers to check to see if a space is too small for them to fit through or not. So, you know, God being like, let's put these things coming off of a cat's face so they know if they'll get stuck inside a box. Like this is just so cool. All right, let's talk a little bit about water animals. I don't know as much about those, but marine biologists who study things like the ocean, right? They believe there are an estimated 230,000 known species that would live in, in the water, right? But they think there could be up to 2 million total different species in the ocean. So we know about 230,000 and they think there could be 2 million that they have yet to discover. We serve a God who can create 2 million different things that live in the water. That is amazing to me. And for all the men out there, or maybe it's for all the moms, the seahorse is the only known living animal species where the male gives birth, not the female. I had to include that one. This is just a tiny list of some amazing like animal and creature facts that show us just how creative God is. I like to listen to a podcast podcast by Emily P. Freeman called The Next Right Thing. And one time she said this, have you ever seen an octopus, the fingernails of a baby, the Grand Canyon, a kangaroo? God is the origin of crazy ideas. Not only crazy, but they are also so creative. So the first thing is that God is creative. We also see in Genesis 1, 29 through 30, that God provides. You see, after God created people, God told them that there was food from every plant yielding seed and every tree that had fruit. And God also provided food for every beast of the earth, bird of the air, and everything that creeps on the earth. God said, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. God provided exactly what was needed for Adam, Eve, and all the creatures. Now notice that God didn't necessarily provide maybe what they wanted. I didn't say anything about bacon or steak. But what was needed. God provides what we need. You know, in the creation story, it is obvious that God is creative and that God provides, right? We just read it in scripture, but it gets better. In Genesis 1, it says, So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. We are created in God's image. Ben talked about that several weeks ago. And because we're created in God's image, God wants us, me and you, to be creative and to provide in this world. Our gifts and talents can be used for kingdom purposes. 
I saw this on Facebook the other day by the skit guys, some funny guys who do comedy stuff, and they said, how cool is it that the same God who created mountains and oceans and galaxies looked at you and thought the world needed one of you too. The world needs you because God made you. You are creative and you are a provider. There is no one else in this world that has been placed where you are with your skills and talents and abilities and passions and heart. And with that, there is great power and great responsibility, especially when we fully claim that God wants to use us because we are created in God's image and we are to be creative people who can make an impact in this world. I want to share a story with you today, a story of creativity and provision, and it is about an organization that started called The Cattle Project. In the summer of 2008, Howard Miami Mennonite Church, where Ben and I served in Kokomo, um, the youth group spent a week volunteering at a variety of locations in downtown Kokomo. You see, we had just flown to San Jose, California in 2007 for the Mennonite Church USA convention. And our youth group checking account was looking a little bit thin. It was pretty expensive to send a huge group on airplanes and pay for convention. And we wanted to do a week of service. We would do convention one year and a week of service the next year. But I really didn't want it to be a financial burden to the church because of lots of fundraisers or to the parents because, you know, we had we had asked so much money from them the year before. And so we decided to do an inexpect, inexpensive week of serving where we stayed at a church in Kokomo and then we served at a different local organization every day that week. Now, Howard Miami is a rural church. It looks a lot like Salem. It is surrounded by corn and bean fields. And the youth group kids are all like rural kids. Some of them farm kids, but mostly just like living out in the country, not city kids. During that week of service, I had youth make comments like, wow, I didn't even know this part of Kokomo existed because they were just used to going to the mall for shopping or to Walmart to buy groceries, not going into Kokomo. It was definitely an eye-opening experience for all of us. Now, one of the locations where we served was Kokomo Urban Outreach. It's an organization that did a lot of things, including at that time they hosted a food pantry. Well, after working in the food pantry at Kokomo Urban Outreach, and seeing the lack of meat on the shelves, Alan Mast, one of our youth, came up with the idea to raise beef steers and donate the meat to Kokomo Urban Outreach. Now I have to tell you, Alan was 15 at the time. He had just finished his freshman year of high school. But Alan had worked for a church member on a small dairy farm, and he had raised maybe two or three cattle to sell the beef to family members. He did 4-H. Um, so, Alan took what he knew and what he loved doing, and he wanted to use that to help others. His parents were not farmers. He did not live on a farm, but he had enjoyed that, and he had learned along the way some things about raising animals. Now, it's definitely a really creative concept, right, for a youth group to raise cows and then donate the beef to hungry families. As his youth pastor, man, I really appreciated his idea, and I knew it would never work. Like, this is not going to happen. Now, I love driving around in Nebraska. I haven't gone lots of places because of COVID, but even just driving to Hastings or to York, I love seeing lots of cattle out in the fields. That's not happening in Indiana, at least not in Kokomo, because it's more populated, and so fields are at a premium. And if you have a field, you are putting crops in it not animals. So it's the soybeans and the corn and the wheat. Raising animals is just not profitable. And so there's a few farmers that might have a couple animals on their farm, you know, to, to butcher, maybe sell a few, but not done widely. So Alan thought, you know, we can do this. And he was just positive that money would come pouring in in order to purchase cows and feed them. 
Okay, now as a youth pastor who just had to get a youth group of approximately, I mean, there are probably 40 of us, to fly to California from Indiana and pay for, I felt like fundraising was my full-time job, not teaching kids about the Bible. And I thought, how in the world are we going to raise enough money to continue this kind of thing very long? I thought it would maybe last a year or two. Maybe we would buy a cow or two and then we would be done. Oh man, I am so happy to tell you I was completely wrong. Because there's something inspiring about a young person, well, any person, but especially a young person who wants to serve others. People want to be part of that vision and that dream and that plan. So Alan contacted a church family that had an empty barn. He rallied the youth group together to fix up the building. They had to take out a basketball goal. They had to put in posts to put up fencing and they had to nail a lot of boards to make sure it didn't rain in and, you know, get the feed all wet and hay wet and whatever. And the church started telling people about this project and church members and community members began donating money and grain and hay. Every day, Alan, who had just finished his freshman year, of high school, he would go and check on the cows. He would make sure that they had their food and water. When he would go out of town, if he went camping with his family or on a trip, he would make sure that there were youth to take over the chores. When he went away to college, he went to Purdue to study agricultural business, uh, his parents carried on the vision and they took care of the animals every day. For just over 10 years, People donated time, money, grain, and hay to this really creative, kind of crazy idea. Many, many, many quarts of chili were made every winter for a yearly fundraiser meal we did. But that was all we had to do because people regularly donated to the cattle project. And all of it began with one young man who saw a need in the world and wanted to provide by using his gifts in a creative way. So I want you to take a few moments and think about three questions. If we want to be creative, first we have to ask ourselves, what do we know? What do you know? Second, what do you love to do? I really believe if God's going to use you to be creative and make a difference in this world, God wants you to enjoy it because I'm sure God enjoyed making all those animals. So first, what do you know? Second, what do you love to do? And third, where are you already living out your life? Now, if there's any children or youth that are watching this or that are part of your life, your grandchildren, your children, your neighbor, I want you to encourage them. I want the children and the youth to know you are learning things right now that God wants you to use to change the world so that you can help others and make a difference. You are not too young to be doing that right now. Because sometimes we make a difference by being kind to the kid that nobody likes. Sometimes we make a difference by helping our parents in a surprising way. Sometimes we make a difference by having a really creative, crazy kind of idea that changes the lives of hundreds or thousands. It doesn't matter if it's big or small, God wants to use you and wants to use your creative ideas. Now, an important piece of this cattle project story is that Alan had a dream based on the food pantry he had worked in. He wanted to take this beef and have it canned to put on the shelves for families to get and take home. But when we spoke with Kokomo Urban Outreach, they had a different idea. By processing all the meat into ground beef, they could put it into soups and casseroles for their Sunday evening meals and for their summer cookouts. They figured that the ground beef from one of Alan's cows, one of these cattle that our youth group was raising, it would be enough to feed 5,000 children women, and men. Now, I don't know about you, but that sort of sounds like a story in the Bible I've heard before. Feeding 5,000? Now, Alan could have insisted on the meat being used the way he wanted it to be used. 
But when Kokomo Urban Outreach said stretching um, the meat for meals, especially meals where they were serving children, was the best way to use the meat, Alan was immediately on board. He wanted the meat to be used to help others, and if they thought that was the best way to do it, he was fine with it. Now, I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where I figure out how things should be and how they should go. You can just ask Ben. I have some strong opinions, and I get kind of frustrated when God clearly has other plans. Because God's plans are always the best ones, even if they don't make sense to us. It can just be hard to trust then. And so I was really proud of Alan for saying, this is what I have to offer. Use it the way you think is best. Well, 10 years after the first nail was put into the barn to fix it up, the cattle project came to an end. In those 10 years, we think the church raised between 37 and 38 cows. We know it was more than 35. We had some people who'd be like, hey, we have this cow. We just want to give it to you. We had a cow that we think was struck by lightning. And let's be honest, we kind of lost count. But if it was, we know it was more than 35 cows. And with that many cows, we figure that the beef from those cows provided at least 175,000 meals. And then in June of 2019, we got some news. Kokomo Urban Outreach no longer had a need for the meat. You see, they had used it in free meals for families and children. And later on, they, they taught some crock pot cooking lessons. And so people could get beef to take home as they participate in this class again, trying to teach healthy wellness. And their needs and their programs changed. And because of that, so did their need for meat. Now, the interesting thing about this situation is we had two cows that had already been butchered in the spring. We got this call in June. And we had five more cows that we were raising. We also had more than $10,000 in our cattle project account. So we had one of the best problems ever. We now had the opportunity to find other groups that needed meat. And we had money to invest in other groups and organizations. After careful prayer and some intentional inquiries, we found organizations that had freezer space and could use one pound packages of beef. We also set some beef aside to have a celebration for the 10 years of the cattle project, which was supposed to happen late spring of 2020. Guess what? Thank you, coronavirus. It wasn't possible to do a meal in this like May of 2020. And so when meat was really hard to find in Kokomo, we were able to sell these one pound packages of beef at a pretty reasonable price to people in the church and the community. And then we could donate that money to organizations that were feeding hungry children. We used money to purchase animals through World Vision, where they send animals uh, to other uh, villages or countries or different places, and then they raise animals to provide in that community. We gave extra funds to a pastor friend in Uganda who was doing a similar project as us, just with different animals. So we had money for cattle that got used to purchase rabbits. Now, I don't care who you are. Only a creative God can turn cows into rabbits, and that's exactly what God did with the cattle project funds. Even at the end of the cattle project, we were able to see ways that God wanted to use the beef and the generosity of the people in the community to provide around the world. God wants to use you to be a kingdom provider. In order to do that, you need to first pay attention to the world around you. What do you see? What do you notice? Where do you see needs? And second, you need to look for places where God is already at work. I believe one of the tragic problems of the larger church is that everyone wants their own program. Everyone wants their own soup kitchen. Everyone wants their own food pantry. Everyone wants their own clothing giveaway. Because then you get the credit. But what would happen if more organizations and churches worked together? Alan saw that there were hungry people who needed meat. And instead of doing his own thing and saying, well, I'm going to start my own food pantry or I'm going to do this, 
He wanted to support a group that already existed, help them do what they were doing even better. When we had extra beef and money, Howard Miami found groups and organizations that we could support by giving them what we had. You see, when you pay attention to what is going on around you and you look for places where God is already at work, then it's a time to be creative. Find ways to join that work using the gifts you have, the things you know, and what you love to do in the places where God has put you. When you do that, the image of God, who is creative and a provider, that's going to shine through you. And it takes work and effort, but it is always worth it. Now, I have one final word of caution for all of us, especially older of us, not the kids and youth, because they just get this. There were many moments in the beginning stages of the cattle project when I was uncertain and I doubted that this could ever work. I could have easily shut down Alan's dream and told him we weren't going to do it. I could have chosen to not support him and not help him. But instead, I simply reminded him several times that I basically knew nothing about farming or about cows, but I could help support him in other ways. God often uses the foolish instead of the wise, and I definitely learned a lot about animals over those 10 years. One of the things that I learned is that I can encourage others instead of being a Debbie Downer. I had a few times where I did have to gently remind or correct the youth or help guide the project, make connections, and let people know what we were doing. But it was incredible to be a small part of supporting a young man's dream to provide meat for hungry people. So what about you? How might God be calling you to use your creative ideas and energy to provide for others? There are thousands, thousands of opportunities to serve thousands of people. I know because God is a creative provider and you are made in God's image. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for being a loving, providing God. And we are so thankful that we are made in your image so we can be creative and provide for your kingdom purposes in this world. God, we ask that you give us the eyes to see the world the way you do. Even if it's just for one second, help us notice your love for humanity. Help us see the brokenhearted, the forgotten, and the unreached. Remind us of where we spend our time, whether it's at school, at work, in our cars, or at our homes. I know, God, you show us opportunities every day. So give us the eyes to see them and help us love people the way you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have extra time this morning, I encourage you to watch a YouTube video that we made from the very beginnings of the Cattle Project. One of our youth made it. You'll get to see Ben approximately 13 years ago teaching some kids how to hammer nails who did not know what they were doing. We're going to post it on the church Facebook page and may it inspire you to be creative and to provide wherever God wants to use you, even if you think it's kind of a crazy idea. Stay warm today and stay safe, and hopefully we'll see you next week. God bless.